I am Dr. David Fern. I'm reader in Greek literature here at Warwick, and I'm going to be talking to you about Homer, Iliad and Odyssey. And in your packs, you should have my three handouts. One is my own handout. This which is got three pages. And the other handouts in there are a printout of an article called Anger Sweeter Than Dripping Honey, which is, I think, at the back. And a photocopied chapter from this book, Homer and the Poetics of Gesture, by Alex Purvis. Uh, so it says on the... Um, from um, It's called... Uh, chap the chapter is called Standing. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, talk to you about a couple of things I think are important and interesting and relevant for contemporary work in Homer from a research perspective, directly in line with what people are actually researching right now. The uh, Thalman article is from 2015. Alex Purvis's book is... I've only had it for two weeks, so it's only just arrived, so only just come out in print. So I'm reading it at the same time as you are. So it's called Homer and the Poetics of Gesture. Um, and a couple of the things, uh, why, why have I juxtaposed these two pieces of bibliography? Because they speak to um, a series of issues that matter to the way we think about Homer as poetry, which is actually potentially really accessible and useful for teachers dealing with how to make Homer relevant or how to make Homer speak to students who haven't ever read any Greek literature before, uh, including for teachers who can't teach the Greek side of it, students who are learning teaching um, Learning, learning classical civilization in studying it in entirely in translation. Um, what you will find in scholarship as, as time goes on is an increasing willingness for pu publishers, including in journal articles, to actually translate. Right? So you don't have to be as kind of terrified as what one might have been in years past with reading journal articles, for instance, or being presented with scholarship where I can't understand any of this because it's all in all in Greek and it's untranslated and there's you know, just huge barriers to entry. Um, the, the main point that I want to make about, uh, for the purposes of this session across both of my um, points, both parts of my uh, handout, so violence and epic with the Thalman article and over onto the second page, standing still, formula as gesture, is that the micro levels, what we might think the really close detail of Homeric style and Homeric characterization, the little formal details that you can engage students in, so the idea of anger as being like smoke and honey, for instance, actually become not only relevant for thinking about Achilles as a character, for instance, in the Iliad, but also about much, much, much bigger things, about what the Iliad is for, what this kind of poetry can do, what kinds of questions it can ask you. And my point from a research perspective is that to say that you can't separate out those two things. It doesn't make sense to separate out the formal properties and characteristics of a poetic text from the kinds of bigger questions that it raises. Because it's only through attention to those formal details, those micro levels of how characterization even works in epic, that you can never actually get a sense of what the poem as an overarching thing is for. So um, both items of the bibliography, both parts of this little talk, are rooted in that point, but from rather different perspectives. So the first part, violence and epic, is about Achilles, and a really important part of Achilles' life in the Iliad, from the perspective of him as a speaker. 
So it's about how does Achilles speak and how does Achilles express himself, the kinds of things that you are asking your students to engage with. What do we, how do we respond to this, this line of rhetoric, for as, it, as it were, in, in, the, in the poetry of a specific passage that you're asking students to respond to? And then the second part, with this idea of gesture, makes headway with what might seem to be a very technical, very rebarbative, very difficult aspect of Homeric style to get across, to particularly to, to the kinds of people you teach. So the idea of what a formula is in Homer sounds just incredibly technical, in, incredibly mired in you know, theories about orality and Homeric composition and the background of that, the sense in which can we even talk about Homer as a literary text if it's an orally composed poem. And the bibliography from Alex Purvis's gesture book moves that sideways so that we can start thinking about the very building blocks of Homeric characterization and storytelling in ways that are not grounded in um, really, really technical aspects, but speak across uh, a, a diversity of kind of approaches and approaches that are, in a sense, more potentially more accessible. So if you look on page two of the handout, standing still, sorry, on my, on my, um, my own handout, immediately below <coughs> standing still, formula, gesture, and the structure of epic space and time, you don't get any lines of Homer, you get this kind of 19th century photographic experiment right, of what happens if you photograph a human being as a series of snapshots in time. And thinking about how the individual kind of moment in time through its uh, formulaic aspect, the ways in which the idea of uh, a moment in time as, re as expressed in, a homo in an individual Homeric line can be thought of as a single part of this broader structure, this broader web, this broader kind of a act of weaving, this broader act of thinking about time. Both in terms of what the poetry internally thinks about time through Penelope, and the return of Odysseus, and how long it's taking, this process of getting through the epic, getting through Penelope's story, but also, therefore, of course, what thinking about epic itself does to help us to think about time, the very idea of what time might mean for us as, as classicists reading epic. So thinking about in this aspect, thinking about a very small-scale thing, like how does Homer write a specific line. Why does Homer repeat this again and again? What's the issue there for how we think about characters? Again, mushrooms out and gets you to think about what epic is, what epic structures are, and how they can make you feel and respond and consider the idea of time at all and, and literature's relation to time. So, fundamentally, fundamentally this, is a, this is a talk about form, about the formal properties of literary texts. I could give a similar talk about other texts. Um, talking about Homer, form is essential because it's the building block of everything. It's the building block of how characters work, about how epic reports and relates and gets you to think about its characters. So form gets you to think about imagery, smoke and, smoke and honey, gets you to think about psychology, characters, characters offering a kind of morality or moral psychology. So the epic, looking at that presentation of a moral psychology, as it were, what do we feel about Achilles, and making that the point. Right? Having Achilles as the principal character of the Iliad makes you focus on what he says and the kinds of things he says and the relationship between the kinds of things he says and the kinds of things he does. 
the kinds of things anybody in the Iliad says and the kinds of things they do or the, th the kinds of things they can't do. And what that makes you think about the world that the Iliad is part of, but then gets you to think about what that says about our worlds. So it's not simply about thinking about the world of Homer as this remote, remote place, <coughs> but about how to make sense of that world as a, as a kind of example of what other worlds might be like, how other worlds might work, what the problems with societies might be, communities might be, what individuals might be, how individuals might shape their own identities in relation to communities or groups. So thinking about smoke and honey with Achilles in the first passage is actually a way into thinking about a kind of a, a, kind of a politics with Homer, a kind of thinking about how Homer works as a kind of social commentary, gets you to think about what Epic can do. You can situate that, as Thalman does towards the end, as a gesture towards thinking about how, how Homer in, con in the contemporary world of, of early archaic Greece works. But you don't have to do that in order to make Homer speak now, because the kinds of questions that Thalman shows that the Iliad is asking through Achilles are ever-present questions. Right, so... Thalman's passage, uh, Thalman's focus is on this passage from Iliad 18, lines 94 to 116, which is on the front of your handout. It's an extraordinary passage from the start of book 18, after Patroclus' body has been recovered, and Achilles is in clear, solid, grieving mode, and Thetis tries to and fails to um, make him feel any better by telling him that he's doomed to a short life because of the kinds of things he's experienced and the kinds of per person he is. That Thetis is this paradigm of bereavement, but, you know, a uh, slightly problematic mother figure for Achilles. And this is one of the passages in the Iliad which reveals how problematic Thetis is as a, as a, as a paradigm for a, for a caring mother figure. So... Thetis says, you're doomed to short life, my son, from all you say. For you, uh, for, for um, hard on the heels of Hector's death, your death must come at once. Um, and Achilles interrupts Thetis and basically shouts back at her. Then let, my, let, then let me die at once, out of Tethnaen in the Greek. And the, in the, the translation I have... Um, which is Robert Fagel's this Penguin translation, is slightly freer with the um, direct transla translation of all the words in the Greek, but actually uh, often captures the force of the rhetoric of speakers more kind of uh, carefully than, uh, for instance, Lattimore's translation does. Um, but Latin was translation preserves the original Greek line numbers. So that's um, something you have to kind of play around with a little bit. Um, uh, Fagel's captures very well the sense in which Achilles is interrupting Thetis by throwing back at Thetis exactly the same words that Thetis used of, about Achilles. That you, you know, you, your death must come pretty soon, Achilles, and let me die straight away. So... Achilles repeats that, that, that word in the, in the Greek, autica, um, at once. Let me die at once, Achilles burst out, despairing. Despairing, he's just angry, right? He's, he's seriously aggrieved. He's not pleased that this is what his mother has told him because she doesn't really understand what he is, how he feels as a human being because she can't feel what it's like to be a human being. This is... This is that is this paradigm of bereavement writ large. She is a goddess. She cannot die, and she is, she is eternally going to suffer because Achilles is mortal. And Achilles is the most rhetorical, rhetorically effective for us of all the Homeric characters in the Iliad, despite what Achilles says in this passage. Achilles says in this passage, other people might be, might be uh, better in words than I am, 
uh, in line 106. Not in battle, only in wars of words that others win. Other people are better in, in speaking than I am. I'm the best in fighting. Actually, what the Iliad shows you is that Achilles is the best character in speaking as well as acting. He is the ultimate Homeric achievement of the Iliad statement of being a, uh, a doer of deeds and a speaker of words. Both go very, very closely together with Achilles. Wh why this passage matters for Thalman, but for any reading of the Iliad, is because it gets you up close and personal with what the, character's mo the, the epic's most eloquent speaker thinks about what his predicament is. Right? What is it to be a mortal? What is, it, what is it to be somebody who is fighting and dying and feeling the emotional intensity of, of what that is? The destructive power but seductive quality of the very idea of violence. Right? We might not like the idea. We don't like the idea of violence. But we know... Achilles knows, and we know, that violence is not ever-present in culture, right? And that is, that is part, of, part of Thalman's point, is to show you and argue across, across his article that this is an issue that matters because Achilles', Achilles recognition that violence is problematic opens up at least a kernel of an idea that the Iliad doesn't kind of play out, of course, because we're the sack of Troy is a fait accompli, that other options might be there. So Thalman does a great job in this article of going through all the passages in the Iliad where the, os 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 the, the prospect of peace is dangled, the prospect of possible other possible outcomes. The kind of thing that's going on in this passage too. Because Achilles here is talking about, well, if we want to get rid of, get rid of this feeling of violence, let bygones be bygones, right? Enough, let bygones be bygones, done is done. Despite my anguish, I will beat it down. The fury mounting inside me, down, right? He's angry with Agamemnon and trying to let that go. But Achilles can't let it go. He can let Agamemnon, his animosity with Agamemnon go, but you can't get this violence, this kind of blinding, psychologically kind of impairing s idea of smoke out of his system, part of his being, to go on fighting and take revenge for the death of Patroclus. Right? And that passage across the opening animosity between mother and son and then this repeated kind of sense of, I've got to kind of quell this idea, push it down, keep it down, but it comes out again, is fundamental to Homer's, in the Iliad's, exploration of the problem of violence for the very idea of what a mortal society might be. Um, so let me, let me just have a look at some of the things in, in, the, in the Thalman article that I want to point you to. <coughs> so, uh, on page 99, for instance, of Thalman's piece, <coughs> 98 to 99 of Thalman's piece, in fact, thinking about violence, on page 98, at the bottom of the page, I prefer to conceive of it as something people do to one another, as a process with social and political implications, rather than a force that is imposed upon you. Right? So, the idea, is, the idea is that the Iliad is negotiating the idea, the possibility that violence might be an external imposition on human, uh, on, on human psychology as a kind of exculpation or, a, or, a, or, a, or at least a reason for explaining its presence. But that a passage like Iliad 18 on the handout reveals that Achilles, and therefore the Iliad, kind of knows that that's kind of not really that true. 
Right? It, it's, a, it's a reason for explaining something, but something that is just part of you that you can't kind of entirely control. But uh, uh, violence is something people do to one another as a process with social and political implications, a medium often of relations between individuals, between groups in a community, between communities and between mortals and gods. So there he's kind of responding to the famous essay by Simone Weil, The Iliad is, or The Poem of Force, which is a Christian allegorical reading of, of the Iliad, very famous uh, piece that you might also uh, want to read. Um, the bit on page 99 that I've highlighted is the, the, the last sentence of the, 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 the main paragraph. My concern here is to consider how the Iliad shows what a world conditioned by violence looks like from the inside and what it suggests the implications are for human life and society. From the inside means from the inside of Achilles as well as the inside of this world. Right, and I think that's why Thalman's jumped on this passage from Iliad 18 because it shows how Achilles' own psychology is a kind of is it is its own is it in itself a kind of metaphor for the nature of the homoic world in which these these people are existing, and Achilles as as that rhetorical speaker is the heroic paradigm that gets us to think about what kinds of people we are what kinds of societies, societies we live in. Okay. Um, on to, just turning over to page 102, um, Thalman shows how this idea of war and violence as an attractive force is thematized elsewhere in the poem, made an issue of elsewhere in the poem beyond uh, Achilles' uh, famous lines here in Iliad 18. So here's this passage from Iliad to 11, lines 10 to 14. With the goddess Eris, the goddess Strife, standing on the ship in the middle of the camp and screaming, the goddess shouted loudly and terribly at high pitch and she cast great strength in, into the Achaeans, each of them, in his heart to wage war and fight without ceasing. And to them, war immediately became sweeter than to go home in the hollow ships to their own paternal land. That sweetness is the same sweetness that Achilles feels as the allure of violence that he's able to articulate for his psychology in the Iliad 18 passage. This passage from Iliad 11 is one of those passages that says, okay, we can outsource the idea of violence as a way of dealing with it or exploring what it, how, it, how its problematics kind of might be, might be felt. Um, one of the things that Thalman goes on to show nicely is that all of these possibilities for different outcomes and different, different meanings for what the Trojan War even is are much more complicated than is often thought and very difficult for anybody to kind of come to terms with. So page 106, top of the page. Um, as the Iliad proceeds, the causes of the war, Helen's theft, the anger of some of the gods against Troy and its purposes, the destruction of Troy, revenge for Patroclus, multiply. And even the plan of Zeus, the dios bule at the start of the poem, the will of Zeus, even the plan of Zeus seems to have more than one possible purpose. The problem is not that the Trojan War is meaningless. It has too many possible meanings and goals, which vary according to the perspective one adopts. This is part of the predicament that we're in when we, in, when we read Homer and think about its different characters, but also think about different characters' motivations and the ways that they respond to their circumstances, as most evidently shown by Achilles. Not only in Iliad 18, but in Iliad 24 with Priam, and in Iliad 9 in his rejection of the embassy, and also in his confrontation with Agamemnon in, in Book 1. 
So Achilles matters here as well. He is the central figure driving these issues. Um, so there's lots, lots of nice things here about um, the poem and cycles of violence that everyone must try to cope with and that no one can help. This is kind of a fairly grim, fairly bleak reading. Um, and he comes over on page 107, right? So he makes a similar point to the point I made at the start. Um, the top start of the third paragraph. My point on page 107. My point is that situations of violence, although they may begin with a well-defined offence and retaliation, seem to widen and to become too big for any mortal con to control. That's what epic is, right? Epic starts from these small things, these small building blocks and mushrooms into this huge thing where multiplicities of responses and ideas and questions, the kinds of questions that narrative raises, of course, about point of view and perspective, and what we think characters are thinking at any one point, that's how epic works itself. Right? From the Iliad's perspective, as Salman really well shows, the idea, grappling with the idea of violence and how violence begins and the reasons you offer for the kinds of conflicts that ensue are actually also the kinds of questions that you can help uh, to articulate your responses to epic with. Right? Epic has very, very, very small building blocks, but becomes this enormous thing. Um, he, goes, he has some nice things about Odysseus and violence as well in the last books of the Odyssey. So it's not just about Achilles, this article. So pages 110 to 11, for instance. And he, he, he talks about how Athena's intervention at the end of the Odyssey is the only outcome that's possible to kind of solve the problem. If one feels that the end of the Odyssey is problematic, it's unsatisfactory, Athena has to come, out, come, out, come in as a deus ex machina to kind of sort it all out and make peace. In the sense in which that has to happen, because otherwise it wouldn't end. It would just keep going on, it would devolve and devolve and devolve. It's kind of an unsatisfactory outcome. It reveals the basic nature of the problem, the parameters of the issue. Um, so he says at the end of page of the main paragraph 111, the Odyssey otherwise, that didn't happen. The Odyssey cannot imagine a resolution of the problem of violence any more than the Iliad can. So the Iliad and the Homeric poems in general ask you the question about violence as inextricably part of human culture and society, and this poses a problem of which the poems make us acutely aware. If violence is so ingrained in human beings, how can a social order exist, let alone flourish? So that's his, that's his basic shtick, right? His basic point is to raise and show you through, a, through an awareness of individual passages and the kinds of things that go on in those, in those details and those characters, some of the basic problems that Epic raises, not just the Odyssey, but also the Iliad. Um, not just the Iliad, but also the Odyssey. And that's a really bleak perspective, a very bleak perspective, particularly on the Odyssey, because I've often thought the Odyssey is this kind of, you know, buildings run on kind of cultural kind of uh, cultural creation model of how, si how, how si human society works on the basis of kind of a, a prescribed uh, normative kind of divine framework where everything, everything works out well in the end. Um, Salman shows you that there are enough parallels with the kinds of problems with the Iliad that doesn't really work that well. How do we, how do we then recuperate? Right? How do we make amends? How do we actually make sense of the Iliad and Odyssey as poems that are kind of positive things to deal with and explore rather than being simply kind of bleak observations on uh, the devastation of human society. The, you know, the, all the models for human society in the Iliad are not ones that you na naturally want to necessarily build on for stable, uh, civilized communities. Um, 
my, my ultimate answer to that uh, is, is, is a kind of uh, base... Uh, it's kind of based on the passage I've given you on the bottom of page one of my handout, which is a passage that isn't in Thalman, but is a passage which is about honey again. And it's an, I think it's probably the first, first usage of the word honey in Homer. Don't, don't quote me on that, but I, I think it probably is. Um, this is Nestor responding directly to um, Achilles and Agamemnon in their massive row in book one. Achilles has just thrown a scepter on the ground and said, Son, such longing will come to the sons of the Achaeans so they paid no, no honour to um, Achilles. He withdraws the threat, this massive threat to withdraw from the fighting and all that, all that, that will entail. And Nestor stands up and between them, and he's introduced in those two lines. The man of winning words, the clear speaker of Pylos, Sweeter than honey from his tongue, the voice flowed on and on. Tu kai apoglosez melitos lukion reen auder. Whatever we think about Nestor as a rhetorically convincing speaker, because he fails, massively fails, this is Iliad book one, right? Achille Nestor is introduced as a speaker par excellence, the most rhetorically kind of... Uh, powerful and alluring speaker in the Iliad. We know differently, because we are going to be introduced to Achilles pretty soon. We feel that Achilles is actually the most rhetorically powerful speaker. What Nestor's introduction does here is dangle in front of you the possibility, at least, that this might be the place to start. This idea of sweetness and charm and uh, language and the allure of language, the allure of speaking, the allure of rhetoric might be a place to begin a kind of cultural exploration, a cultural journey of what Homer can do to you. We want to bear in mind everything that Thalman says about the tension written across both the Iliad and the Odyssey between violence and its allure but we also want to kind of find a space for the, for the idea that the Iliad's narrative is championing these ideals, even as its own characters don't necessarily, cannot necessarily match up to those ideals. Nestor isn't the great speaker that the Iliad introduces him as being, but it doesn't mean to say that Homeric narrative doesn't know that there might be other possible outcomes, or uh, is built out of a society where that is itself a standard, right? a rhetorical standard upon, upon which you know, a more positive outlook for individuals and societies and communities, so a kind of a politics with Homer, might, might start. Um, it's, it's interesting to me that this comes out through imagery. So again, it's the focus on the small, the small detail. That's also why Iliad 18 matters, because Iliad 18 is not only the, the book that has this amazing passage from the start in it, but it's also the passage of the shield in it. And the shield is the piece in the Iliad where you want to go to, to see other worlds functioning, other possibilities working. Um, similarly with Iliad 23, with the, war, the, the, um, the funeral games with Patroclus, although violence is kind of threatening, always threatening to burst out there too. Um, so imagery... The idea of what poetry can do, the idea of poetry itself as, as potentially kind of charming and alluring and sweet, and something we enjoy, is what Homer is implicitly telling you about and getting you to understand. This is, this is the stuff. This is the building blocks of society. Poetry is where to begin. Right? Poetry is where to begin. It's a where to begin because it has this outlook. It has this view of worlds which aren't necessarily positive paradigms, but have seeds in them, things that you can take and build on and work through and uh, live with. So I think, I think that's what I'm going to say about uh, that, that first uh, bit of bibliography. Um, what I want to go on slightly more briefly, and I've given you some more of the quotes 
uh, from, from the second item on the handout, on my handout as well as uh, in the, in the um, main photocopy of Alex Purvis's book, is to think, think about, to get you to work with how the structure of Homeric po poetics can be communicated in ways that are kind of comprehensible and can be used, can you, you can draw on other kind of cultural comparisons in order to help to understand. Um, so this idea of gesture, the idea of different bodily movements, different stances, different actions that human bodies perform in the Homeric poems, that formalisms and lines in Homer are repeated to emphasize is a way of thinking about how the poetry is built. And her entire book, as she says, is built on, built on chapters where she goes through individual kind of gestures that articulate different ways of understanding how characters act, how characters perform, how characters do things, but also how characters don't do things. So the chapter I've printed out for you is the, is the chapter called Standing, which is mostly focused on where characters don't do things, but are formula formulaically repeated gestures of standing still. What does it mean for an epic that one of the most important insistent gestures or formulas in Homer is not doing anything at all, but standing still? Um, Purvis's main focus in this chapter is on Penelope, but she plays off uh, Penelope against Achilles. Achille because Achilles is a person who stands still too, but stands in opposition. Achilles is a character from the very opening of the Iliad, line six. Diasterten stood in division. Achilles is a character who stands in opposition, stands opposite somebody else, is confrontational. Right? setting up the Iliad as a, as a series of confrontations between people. Obviously, that's what the Iliad is about. It's about war. It is about kind of a binary. But as the Iliad shows you from the very outset in line six to seven on the handout, it's not a binary in the ways that you would naturally assume a war to be a binary. It's a war that's got wars within the war, right? The wars between personalities, um, between Agamemnon and Achilles. But what, what Purvis brings out very well from the Iliad's perspective is how this idea of standing gets you to think about Achilles as a force, but also as, you know, how that, how that helps to understand the Iliad as a structure, a structure of gestures where standing is one part of them. It gets you to think about the whole idea, the, this, big, this big confection, the whole structure in which individual gestures of this kind <coughs> have a part to play which is why she um, brings in these uh, photographic kind of <coughs> parallels. Um, how that works with Penelope is important because with Penelope, it gets you to think about weaving as well. Thinking about Penelope standing still and Penelope's journeys in the epic. What does Penelope do in the, in the Odyssey? Where does she move? She moves back and forth. She goes up to her room and she comes back. She stands down by the center of the well-built, uh, she stands by the pillar which holds up the whole palace. She stands in the Megaron. She goes up to her room, comes down to the Megaron. She goes up to her room, down to the Megaron. She does this four, four times at very important points. Uh, in book one and obviously all the way up to book 21, which is the start of the end for the suitors. Um, Odysseus, uh, sorry, Penelope stands in the middle of the Megaron. She is like the pillar. Odysseus, by, conflict, uh, by contrast, doesn't stand by the pillar. When he is in, in, uh, figured as standing or sitting, he's on the threshold. Right? He is a man who is coming in and doing something. He is, a, he is a liminal figure in the way that kind of he is that, that captures... That captures him as a man of action. With Penelope, 
is about the static nature of her, her being as a way of thinking about everything else that's going on beside her. If she is static, everything else is moving. So Purvis thinks that Penelope is a bit like a photograph, like a single kind of photographic you know, um, exposure. It's kind of a ca a, a capturing a moment or a snapshot in time where that moment is preserved forever, but lots of things moving on around, around it. That's that's where um, she she I've got on on your handout there on the on the third page of the handout references in in, in Purvis's chapter to where she she makes these uh, parallels. Um, you can pair Pen you can also use this idea of standing standing still in a palace to help understand Penelope in reference to other characters. So that formula that gesture. Is used five times in the, in the Odyssey, four times of Penelope, and once of Nausicaa in Odyssey 8, which is Nausicaa saying bye bye to Odysseus. And that, for Purvis, kind of says this allows you to see the kinds of possibilities afforded to other kinds of characters and other possible situations that Penelope doesn't have access to. Penelope is a more static character because her responsibilities are rooted to that particular place. She is not able to go through those, those kind of options. But we get to see those other options through that same gesture, through the parallelism with Nausicaa, who is obviously a rival kind of paradigm for what a, a, a maritable um, uh, uh, partner for Odysseus uh, might be. This is, of course, important for thinking about the status of women in the Odyssey, which might, might be thought to be important. Um, so this is Purvis, uh, again, on my third page of the handout. I do not mean to suggest that Penelope has no effect on her audience when she stands beside the house's central roof pillar, but I do want to draw attention to the equation female is nothing as male is to heroics power doing something that standing as a quintessentially neutral pose particularly illuminates. It gives us one way, for example, of parsing the difference between Achilles and Penelope as epic characters who adopt a standing position at crucial moments in their respective plots, but also of differentiating between Odysseus and Penelope in the Odyssey. Right, so from their respective positions, Odysseus stands and acts, while Penelope stands and speaks, often ineffectually. Penelope is the proverbial long-standing wife and preserver of the home, is also the Odyssey's eternal iterator, the figure who retraces the same pathway back and forth across her loom or up and down between her bedroom and the great hall Megaron below. Her placement in the frame of the staff moss of the pillar seen signals through its return to the same, the persistent unchangeability of formulaic time when, as here, it is somehow left unaffected by the contingent circumstances of each separate appearance. What this, what this does is kind of afford a, a more kind of positive, a more resilient sense of Penelope as a character who endures in a way that is comparable to but very different from the way in which Odysseus endures. Because Penelope, in this sense, in, in the, her movement and in, her, in the figure of weaving, is also the figure, is also the paradigm for epic, in the Odyssey's terms, as the thing that endures. Penelope is the paradigm for epic in the same way for the Odyssey, in, in, in kind of parallel ways as, as Achilles is the paradigm for epic on all its complexities in, in the Iliad. I think that's very important, um, and I think that's uh, crucial uh, for thinking about um, time, for thinking about epic and epic as time, and epic as something in time. Epic as an epi epic as an as a as a as a process of a narrative that takes place in time with a plot, but also something about epic as enduring itself, that's repeating 
that gestures repeat. An epic itself is a repetitive gesture. It goes on and on and on and on, a bit like Nestor, but in a more positive way. Right? So the Iliad and Odyssey are full of these kind of rival ideas for what you know, long-windedness and going on and on and on rep repetition is, but ultimately afford you a sense of why it matters, right? that continuity through space as well as time. And I think that's why, and I'm still reading, so I haven't read all of this book yet, but I've given you bits from the introduction which I have read and bits of the conclusion to tell you how this is a really useful way in thinking about how focusing on characters, but also focusing on that really small detail that people think, why should I bother with that? What does that matter? Get you to think much, much more broadly about why reading epic or thinking about epic matters at all. And making it immediate, making it live, making it now. Because it's about process through time. It's about you know, the sense in which this is a repetitive thing because culture needs these repetitions. It needs this is an insistency. This insistence of focus on morality and ethics and being and what, what being a person in a world, a community, a household, a society, what a society might be, uh, even is. But what a kind of poetics is. Um, you know, what, what, what charm um, is on offer, what culture can do. But Homer is always repeating and enforcing this idea that the most important thing here is the charm of the poetry. The charm of the poetry that's insistent, like Achilles, but also like Penelope, insistent, ever-present. This, this presence across time that is kind of always commenting, but somehow standing still, always commenting on what everything else is going on around it. Right? So a bit like a photograph in, in Purvis's kind of idea. Um, I think hopefully you can see why, why these ideas, especially from the Purvis, help you to possibly, hopefully, grapple with the idea of how to sell the very small scale things in Homer and how to make them make sense and how to connect them with bigger things. And my basic being is do not separate out the small scales from the big issues. Um, and I think that helps you um, be aware that the kinds of things that you're asking your students to, to grapple with dealing with the small questions about how characters behave and how we feel about them in individual scenes and passages can have this bigger consequence that you can maybe build in or at least um, help to help to reveal. So there isn't a, it's also a, a, a kind of a sense of saying you don't need to be anxious about building in scholarship with Homer because it's, it's, it's doable. It's not that I'm going to say to you all the stuff you think about teaching small-scale passages and thinking about characters needs to be jettisoned because of these other big things going on in scholarship that have nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with that. It's just that we kind of want to push those small-scale observations and details about style and character and worlds into bigger questions. And the bibliography I've helped to explore today aims to do that. Um, 